Okay. So we're at the hour. So good morning, good evening, everyone around the world that are that you're if you're joining us um, today. Um, thank you. This is the ICSD speaker series. Um, actually, take three uh, because we've had already two. So this is the third one. Um, today we have two really really interesting speakers uh, joining us. We have Neha Sharma and Daniel Abdul Rahman, um, both from the um, Southeast Asia region, if I can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what, how I'm identifying it. And so we will begin this morning with uh, Neha Sharman, and, and the process will be each speaker will speak for about 30 minutes, uh, they will do a PowerPoint, and we will then take at least one uh, question that you can um, add to the Q&A. Um, at the end, when both speakers have spoken, then we will open it up for questions for both, okay? Um, and this is your session to really learn about what it is that they do, how they've gotten there, um, their thoughts on, you know, the integration of SDGs into the work, if any, um, et cetera. So let me begin by really, really welcoming Neha Sharma. She is the co-founder of HIM Healthcare. It's a medical healthcare enterprise based in the lower Himalayan regions of India. She is a clinical yoga and Ayurvedic nutrition expert. Her mission is to promote holistic health and sustained well-being by integrating modern medicine practices with yoga and traditional medicinal therapies. Along with this, she has over 10 years of experience in the education technology sector. She specializes in instructional design and learning design pedagogy in online learning environments, especially in context of developing countries. She works with multilateral organizations on integrating knowledge on sustainable development issues across their training and education programs targeted at sustained learning outcomes. She has also been associated with the UN SDSM for the development of technology-based learning solutions on mainstreaming, cross-cutting issues to include education for all, gender parity, human rights-based approach, sustainable agriculture, and environmental social safeguards. Neha is a biotechnologist by training and hosts a postgraduate degree from the Indian Institute of Technology, um, Guwahati. Welcome, Neha, and thank you for being with us. Over to you. Thank you so much, Lucia. Every time I hear my own introduction, it just feels very strange. I'm not sure if it's the same with everybody, but it feels like you're listening about somebody else. Uh, welcome, everyone. And since I'm the first speaker, as I was told, or it was like a nice surprise for me, I thought Daniel was going in first. Uh, so I think it's my responsibility and duty to welcome all of you. For people who are from the Eastern Hemisphere, good morning or good day. And from the other side, thank you so much for staying up late if it's late evening uh, for you. Now, um, I have half an hour to talk about what I do and, and you know, then there are questions which you can have for me. But I was thinking that before we jump into the presentation, there are three small questions which I have for you. And if you would be so kind to just answer them, just so that I get to know you a little bit better. And once we do that, then we will jump straight into the presentation. So I'm going to share my screen. And what I would request you to do is to scan this code using your smartphones. Or if you're already uh, logged in using your smartphone, can you please go to slido.com and enter this code? And as soon as you do that, you will come across three very simple questions. I don't want you to overthink it. I just want you to go with your gut and say the first thing which comes to your mind. So scan this code. And if it's fine, I would like to move to the next slide. And if I can see you vote on this. Okay. Thank you. All right. The code is right here and the QR code is also right here. Is 
interesting. I see nobody wants to mind read and nobody already has a superpower. All right, next question. What is your ideal vacation? Back with adventure, lying on a beach, doing nothing, maybe sipping a margarita, sleeping for three days straight and Netflixing probably, or going off grid completely. Unless you are one of those chosen few who don't need a vacation and life is a big holiday. All right. And if we can move to the last question. Oh, 14% people say that their life is a holiday. Now I'm jealous of you all. Now to the last question, please. Okay. All right. 43% of people say that they are stressed in the range of four to seven. So here's the thing. The reason these questions seemed very casual, they seemed very um, icebreaker type, but they were actually not. And as you can understand that each of the questions had a very important health related aspect to it, right? In the very first question, a lot of you, a vast majority said that they wanted to be healthy and fit forever. And the second highest points were for to be able to eat without getting fat, because that is one concern which all of us had. You wanted to take a vacation where you did nothing, just lay on the beach where you could just get a break from your uh, current everyday life. And right now, this is the most pertinent of them all, because we, all of us here, uh, predominantly are between the age range of 20 to 40, I would like to say, plus minus a few years. And we all feel that we are not, we are somewhere in the middle when it comes to our stress levels. So we are, we are either at seven or at four of the stress index. And this, as you can understand, is not an ideal situation for, for any of us. I know uh, health-related facts seem a little scary at first when you start talking to people, but I think that, and I've also learned the hard way, that that is the only way to sometimes wake people up and shake them up. Because most of us, being a part of the work culture we are, we understand the tenets of sustainable health. We understand what it means to have lifelong wellness. But when it comes to our own individual personal health, work always takes priority. We wake up at odd hours. We stay up late just because there are deadlines to meet. And it's not a one-off scenario. It often happens and repeatedly happens. Watching Netflix till 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. is not something which is completely unusual. Waking up at five and going to bed at 10 is something which is not a possibility for us. And as a reason, and I know that these are the tenets which should be practiced, but our lives right now do not permit us to follow them. Now, add to that some very glaring facts. Now, I have some numbers from WHO data here which say that if you're living in an urban, populate, uh, urban polluted city like New Delhi, New York, Melbourne, you are likely to lose two to six years of your life. Add to that a sedentary lifestyle, a lifestyle where you sit behind your desktop and work for most part of the day, maybe eight to 10 hours where you are sitting and you are likely to lose eight years of your life. And then if you follow something which is known as a Western diet, now don't take it on the terminology. Western diet doesn't necessarily mean a diet which is followed in the West. Western diet is a term which is used for diet, which is very low in fiber and heavy in red meat and carbohydrates. So if you follow that diet, then you lose up to about 11 years of your life. And in total, so six to seven, eight and 11, pollution, sedentary lifestyle and a Western diet can likely make us lose around 20 to 30 years of our lives. Immortality is not something which most of us want. 
but we would still want to live a life which is full of health and well-being for as long as we are here on this planet. Unfortunately, because of the world we are living in, the environment we are living in, and our current lifestyles, it's becoming more and more difficult with every day. Now, you all know that goal three focuses on good health and well-being. And this is this is not just about for a particular age group, but this is across age groups, across their lifespans. Important thing to note here is that health and well-being is not just a temporary um, you know, thing. It's something, it is a continuum. It is a spectrum where you are mentally and physically fit throughout your entire course of life while living it. So understandably that you can't spend your entire, you know, 10 hours in a day focusing on your health, but that should be a priority and a top one at that matter while you tackle the rest of the facets of your life, which are your work, your relationships, your enjoyment, everything. But your health should always be at the back of your mind and at the center of your life existence. Things have become challenging right now more so because we are all recovering from the aftershocks of COVID-19, right? So again, I don't have to quote numbers here, but we know that during the time of COVID, a lot of our health goals were pushed by three to five years, you know, vaccination, mortality, uh, maternal health. A lot of them were pushed by five years. One thing which also took precedent was this one small thing which said that there was a prevalence of anxiety and depression in the population at large, which was exacerbated by the pandemic. And all of us at some time, most of us at least I would like to say, had experienced bits and pieces of it when we were cooped up in our houses. There was stress of the looming disease. There was stress of, of you know, making ends meet. There were people who had relatives who were unwell or friends or family who were unwell. There were people who were facing challenges with their employment. The stress level and the anxiety levels of people and, and add to that that you can't meet, you can't socialize, you can't be in a community where you can share thoughts. There was a spike in mental health related issues. And now when I'm talking about it, in the very first, when we were talking, like I, I spoke about how pollution, sedentary lifestyle and um, a diet was the problem. Now in COVID-19, these three issues also became very prevalent. We were all sitting on our computers and working, managing, maintaining a sedentary lifestyle. We were eating whatever we could because not everybody was motivated enough or had the privilege to eat organic, clean, green food every time. So it was a double whammy. So originally you were in a bad state anyway because of living in a big city, all of us, and add to that COVID, and now here we are. This is what we call non-communicable diseases, anxiety, depression, lack of physical activity. This leads to a set of diseases known as lifestyle diseases, which is a subset of non-communicable diseases. Why are they called lifestyle diseases? Because simply they are they occur due to poor health choices which we make every day. And this can be poor nutrition, this can be severe stress, this can be physical inactivity, uh, biological clock. I keep repeating the same thing that some of these things are, we, we don't choose this set deliberately. We don't choose to screw up our lifestyle deliberately. Sometimes we have to. And when we do that, when we make that choice that right now our work will take precedence or this, you know, this hustle side of my life will take precedence, the first thing which we choose to ignore is health. And under the ambit of health comes these things where we start making, we start opening packets of packaged foods. We, we don't take even five minutes in our day to unwind and relax or to just be with ourselves. We don't be out in nature. We, we work till 11 or 12 in the night. And then because we have to unwind, we watch television for another three hours. Your body does not understand this. Your, there is something known as circadian rhythms. And I think people here would, would know about this, how your body is attuned to the movement of the sun. 
So while socially we understand where this is coming from, genetically the way your body has been coded, this does not make sense. And what happens is that next day you, you wake up groggy and then you start all these health issues start accumulating. Health issues, which are very, very um, predominantly lifestyle-based, as you can see, are obesity, backache, hypertension, impaired glucose tolerance, fatty liver, and depression or mental health diseases. And we see them rising every day in front of our eyes in this very own co in this in this same uh, age group, our friends, our families, us as well. People are getting so that there, there are several several issues of so even if we remove mental health illnesses out of the gambit because that's a completely different set of challenges backache hypertension diabetes type 2 now these are becoming common issues and if not treated then they can lead to very severe ailments like alzheimer's stroke heart diseases chronic liver diseases and right now, it might just seem something which I'm talking about, you know, just because I have to make this presentation. What we don't realize is that these diseases are responsible for 70% deaths every year. Now, 70% is a huge number. On one hand, our systems are trying to combat communicable diseases, trying to maintain health and pro provide health care um, to people vertically and horizontally. But then 70% diseases are being or 70 percent deaths are being caused due to non-communicable diseases which can be managed if a person's lifestyle was managed well and it would be interesting if you see the small block on the left side which says that these diseases are also dubbed as western diseases or diseases of affluence why because the concept predominantly started with people who had more and who could do things like not going out to work, stay indoors and work, instead of having to cook, opening a packet and eating. And then, of course, living in big cities. But now the irony of the situation is that what started as a Western disease, and I might quote, is the is 85% of these deaths, which are caused due to lifestyle-based diseases, are now coming from low and middle income countries. So now there is a massive shift. What, what, what started by people who had more has now translated or moved over to the people who don't have a choice. And now it's the privileged lot which can afford to eat clean, which can afford to have um, you know, a physical instructor, a nutritionist, everything. But people who are still struggling cannot afford to make those choices. So it's a very, very strange shift of dynamics which has happened in the past few years. And now let's talk about why this should concern you because right now, this age group of 20 to 30 or 20 to 40 seems healthy enough. Your body can take the shocks. So there are people who might be able to visit, finish one or two pizzas in a single setting. And there are people who might, might be seeing tiny changes in their bodies, you know, joint pains here and there, back pains rising up gradually. But with the help of medicine and support, you're still powering through, you're still moving ahead. Then why it should be a concern? Simple reason. The seeds which you're sowing now will bear fruits in the next 10 years. Right now, your body is in a shape and state where it can take all these shocks but everything will start becoming evident and visible as your body starts aging. It's a strange kind of a gender equalizer, as I call it, because we keep talking about parity in every conversation we have. But when it comes to lifestyle-based diseases, women suffer a big brunt, like they suffer the brunt of, of most challenges we face. Women are the primary caregivers and have less access to healthcare or to proper nutrition or to proper counseling and guidance when it comes to mental health as opposed to men. And the reason, and because of that, 7% of all women have high blood pressure. There is a massive spike in, in the cases of stroke. And 28% of all young women suffer from obesity and type 2 diabetes. And they live with it. That's the biggest catch. 
suffering and managing and then getting a solution does not ever happen. They just live with it. Hormonal imbalances is, is a very, very common, commonly, uh, you know, it's, it's something which is very common across women of all ages. People, people choose to live with PCOS. Doctors keep prescribing medicines. Women keep pumping uh, hormones in their bodies and just, again, living through them, powering through them. It deteriorates the system. And let's just talk about what's wrong with this current system of existence. The problem is that whenever we are talking about conventional medicine, which is an excellent feat of science, all allopathy, lifesaver. However, this lifesaver defaults, falls, falters on one particular step, which is it treats the symptoms and not the individual. You go to a doctor for a skin rash and they will give you a medicine for the rash. They will not understand or bother unless they are extremely uh, you know, good, good practitioners, that this rash flares up every time in your body when you're stressed or when the season changes or whenever X, Y, Z thing happens. Because your skin is, 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 is not stupid. It's not silly. It, it understands. A rash is not erupting on your skin out of the blue. Allopathy right now is very symptomatic when it comes to treatment um, protocols. It does not really take disease causa causality into account. It does not understand the root cause. It does not focus on the root cause. So if your symptom is treated, you can go home and rest up. If it reoccurs, you can come back and then the same treatment would be given to you or a little more aggressive and then you go back again. However, at the very onset of a particular symptom, finding going to the root of it is not something which is coded in allopathic medicine. Particip no active participation of patient in self-care is also very important because when you go to a doctor, they will prescribe you a medicine and you will not have multiple options but to take that medicine. Some care to explain what the problem is and why you are taking this medicine and some don't. But taking that drug is imperative. Your care is very, very, in a very limited manner, it's in your hands. So is there something which you can do from your end to eliminate is it completely is something which does not happen very frequently. Now, allopathy also, while it saves lives, and I keep saying that because I'm a big proponent of that, while it saves lives, it does not take into account the individual physiology culture and the environment of a person. A person sitting in Toronto will also take paracetamol and so will a person sitting in a remote village with, um, you know, in India when they have fever. They don't understand what's the difference between these two individuals. Why are they, are they suffering from this fever? What is happening? What is their environment? What is their food practices? It's this one uh, shoe fits all kind of a drug approach which we are currently focusing on. Now, how the, 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 the solution to this is nothing but to make the patient stakeholder integrating medicine uh, systems which take an individual into account, which give the power to the individual. And then this should not just happen at an individual level, but this, should, this requires a systemic change where the whole system understands that there are other medicinal practices as well which can fortify the current existing system, not replace, not supplant, but fortify the current existing system of allopathy. And this is why my partner and I got into, so we, we got obsessed with this idea and we started this organization known as HIM Healthcare. And what we do at HIM is that we run metabolic longevity programs, basically programs which target an individual individual, their physiology and their metabolism for maintaining their happy life, a healthy life and helping them attain their full health potential. And how we do it is that we bring together allopathy along with Eastern medicinal practices and then combine them to create personalized treatment plans for the patients who come to us for these lifestyle-based diseases. Now, uh, again, as I was saying, type 2 diabetes is something which is a lifestyle disease. 
generally what happens is that uh, you have to stay on medicines throughout your life. Through Anybody who has known a person or has had type 2 diabetes would know that the only solution to this is stay on a medicine, stay away from sugar, stay away from sugar heavy foods and work out, right? This is the, the prescription, the standard prescription which is provided in allopathy. When you include Eastern medicinal practices, for example, yoga or Ayurveda, yoga and Ayurveda claim that type 2 diabetes can be done away with completely. And it's hard to understand because, again, this science does not directly correlate with that science. This new science which we are learning, we, it has got nothing to do with the way things are explained in yoga or Ayurveda or maybe Chinese traditional medicine for that matter. But once you start applying those practices, you see the changes. Most of it is experiential and you start seeing the changes. And this is what we are trying to do here. Why keeping allopathy still at the center of things, we are trying to create a system where these practices also take the forefront. These practices are not just go home and do yoga kind of prescriptions. Because again, yoga is not just asanas. That is a very, very huge misconception about this. Ayurveda is not just uh, drinking herbal teas and adding turmeric to your lattes. It's definitely not that. But they are, they are extensive scientific systems which claim to manage lifestyle-based diseases to a very vast extent as opposed to allopathy, which talks about instant treatments. And this is what we are doing. Combining Eastern practices and conventional allopathic medicine so that a person can enjoy a sustained health outcome, something which not, not just goes, um, you know, as soon as they leave us, we don't want clients to be or, or patients to be in a state where as long as they are with us, they are healthy. And the moment when they go back home to their regular lifestyles, uh, you know, everything falls apart. So how can you provide them with a structure which man maintains this, this state of well-being, which maintains the sustained health for a longer period? And how do we do that? We bring in the facets of nutrition, gut health optimization breath work, and as I was talking about yoga, um, and cardiac fitness, all of this together, and at the center of it lies nature. Every time I talk about this, this seems more like hokum, because whenever you talk about nature, the, the image which comes to your mind is you are on a retreat somewhere in the mountains, and you feel nice, and you feel awakened, and, and, and you know, all good things which people talk about. Basically, you are you know, it's an eat, pray, love kind of a situation which is happening. That is something which we want people to stay away from. It is in the mountains, yes. It is intrinsically related with nature, yes. But then there's a reason behind it. Not just because nature is pretty and mountains are pretty and, you know, you'll feel different and cut off from your city life. The reason is that biophilia is a very, very important component of our existence. The understanding Philosophical understanding of, of there is oneness in everything is one thing, but practical understanding that you are not too far away from nature. You are nature, basically. You breathe in the oxygen which the plants are releasing and, and the cycle continues. And then I'm not sure how many of you know about this, for instance, this concept of uh, forest bathing or Shinrin Yoku. Now, this is a Japanese concept and there are, there are multiple researchers and papers on this which prove that if... Staying out in nature or in a forest, hence forest bathing, for around 20 minutes every day can actually bring down your cortisol levels or your stress hormone levels significantly. And again, that doesn't mean that you have to be in a forest or in a mountain or in a park. A simple plant kept on your desk, and if you are engaging, if you are, you know, if you're focusing on that plant for at least five minutes every day, just understanding, you know, connecting with it, you can see the decrease in your stress levels. And that is when these are just simple examples, right? So my, the, the point which I was trying to make is that nature is not just there for being pretty and making you feel good for as long as you're there. 
it import it holds a very very important part when we are talking about your overall health and well being and this is a point which we try and drive home to people who are cooped up unfortunately in their cubicles or in their offices or in their apartments for long periods of time and how it's important and why it's important so as i said we have allopathic medicine clinical nutrition ayurveda we try to bring in nature consciousness counseling and therapy for mental health and yoga we try and combine all these aspects to talk about a sustained well-being or a state of sustained well-being for individuals we have residential programs and then we have online presence so residential programs are obviously more intensive because people come and stay with us for 5 or 15 days and then it's easier to work with them because they come with a gamut of of ailments and understanding the root cause of that ailment itself takes time so a person who's there uh, uh, with you complaining of backache or chronic joint pain it's again it's not always that one particular thing it's it's never joint pain alone it's always multiple things which are related to that for which um, eastern practices become helpful so we try and manage their current problem point while understand what the problem is intrinsically and behind that core problem through eastern practices and once they go home we hold their hand for a sustained period of time through our online programs so that they can stay with us and we can manage and monitor them in case they need help uh we are trying to create a system here where we uh we do things as organically and as local as possible we have partnered with the uh, uh, small scale farmers who are growing all the food which we cook here uh the workforce is entirely women and that is something i think which uh, which working uh, in the sdg world somehow it that is something which is drilled in your psyche and you can't run away from that and it's beautiful it it leads to brilliant results um so we have an entirely women led team who manage this agriculture who manage nutrition um we are uh, talking about training so we not only train people who come to us we also deliver training at the local level uh, to to people who are around us basically to the to the village people who who are around this uh, him healthcare center and then we use technology to monitor all of these things and uh with this i think i would like to wrap up but before i wrap up here's the thing this is what we do at him now the question is that how can you take it forward my presentation is over but does that make any sense to you once you shut your computers down i have just a few points to give you which you can take home with if you're interested and one thing is that as a practitioner of sustainable development or as somebody who's interested in health one thing which we will have to learn is to come out of our silos and start seeing things as a whole stop focusing on the parts take a step back get some perspective and start seeing things as a part of a bigger picture one particular medicine or one particular format of medicine is never the solution what are the other practices which are prevalent in the world one individual and their problem is not enough that is not not everything what else is happening with that individual if that person complains if you complain of one thing try and identify what else is going on in your life which might have precipitated this try and understand the concept of this oneness of this wholeness on a very scientific level how you need, and this is something which will i think which will also go a long way when you move into the world of or are into the world of policy and advocacy where once you start focusing on one problem don't get into it too deep while while pushing the agenda forward always remember that there are multiple things associated with it there are multiple factors associated with it which need to also be taken care of second focus on your self health right now again work will always take precedence but there are tiny things which you can do which can make you a little bit more fitter every day try and inculcate some physical activity even if it's walking walk from the subway station to your office that's fine 
If it's too hot, find a way to work out for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever your most favorite mode of workout is. Try and use that every day. Keep some time out for yourself where you are not on your phone, where you are not reading a book, where you are not engaging mentally with anything. And this, I'm telling you, is one of the most difficult things which you can ever do. Try and be with yourself for five minutes by the clock without doing anything. You will start getting bored. You will start getting restless. Try and practice that. See if you can do that. And understand that your body is unique. This is a paradigm which comes, which comes from Ayurveda that every individual is unique. Every body physiology is unique. There are, there are strict prescriptions about how some people would benefit from eating warm foods, whereas some people would benefit from eating cold foods. So where are you on the spectrum? Read up more, try and understand more, understand what your body wants. Why do you feel like eating a warm bowl of oatmeal as opposed to a dry toast in the morning, whereas your friend wants to do the exact opposite? So try and create these small health goals for yourself. Find at least five minutes of time, and I can't go below five minutes. Find at least five minutes of time for yourself where you don't do anything every day. And hopefully, we can all live a sustained, healthier life. Uh, these are just some pictures I had from the healthcare center, which we run. Uh, this is in the lower Himalayan region of India. And these are the two people who started this healthcare initiative and one of them would be appearing on your screen in now so i think that was it from my end and now i will pass the baton to lucia and see what she has to say thank you so much for your patience everybody wow thank you so much neha really refreshing and exactly what i needed after you know we've been at this conference for now of uh, several days and prior to it preparing and health has actually gone out the window i mean i haven't even thought about it but it's so oh wow very very good thank you um i have a, a question though um and what we'll do like i said we'll take a question one question at least and then we'll go to the next speaker and then we'll come back for more questions um how um did this was this always a dream of yours to start this center or did is it something that was triggered by some kind of experience in your life and you decided that you had to maybe change routes? Um, yeah. Be, yeah. Can you share a little bit of that with us? I would be happy to do so. It's one of my favorite life stories. <laughs> so uh, I have been a, uh, an education, a sustainable development and education person throughout. Learning pedagogy and frameworks has been my field of expertise. But I was, I'm also a trained yoga practitioner and an Ayurveda clinician uh, on the side. Now, what happened is that my partner, he is an oncologist. So, a, you know, hardwired allopathic medicine doctor. And when we were living together, we used to butt heads quite a lot because when I used to tell him to do a certain thing, he used to call it hokum because... There is nothing like, why does yoga claim this? I don't have scientific papers to do that. Now I do. But then at that point, I didn't have enough evidence to say that why are things happening? Why am I eating this? And why are you not eating this? So there was a huge clash in our own home where these, you know, the Eastern side and the Western medicine clashed almost every day. And we fought a lot. It was very difficult to find uh, congruences. But um, once we stopped fighting, we actually started looking for, because if we had to stay together, we had to find ways where we could, you know, coexist. So that's what we started doing. And then gradually, and then COVID happened. And that's when we realized that most of the governments around the world are struggling to find optimal solutions to combat this. People, people were just scrambling. They were looking for solutions wherever they could find. And that's where we came in and we thought that Maybe this is something which could be helpful. So we used those two years of COVID, um, you know, we, we went back to the drawing board. We tried to find out, you know, what, what science had to say, uh, found out all the facts 
as opposed to just beliefs and experiences. And together came up with frameworks and we started uh, HIM Healthcare. That was also a time we realized that we were both living in Delhi and we realized what can't afford to lose 20 to 30 years of our lives and took a drastic decision where we packed our stuff up and we had very little money on us or whatever, but then we just moved to the hills um, and uh, started living in a small setup. And now here we are. <laughs> oh, excellent, excellent. I am in the West, um, but definitely just based on what, you're, what you've shared with us today, very, very curious um, in terms of what you do. And, and not just, I want both, not just the online program, but also the actual experience, because I definitely need it. <laughs> and I think everybody else here, I'm sure will need it as well. So we're going to move on to the second speaker. Um, but what we will do, though, is um, um, please keep your questions coming in the Q&A. Um, and actually, before we move on, I see your partner has joined us. And, you know, um, so hi, thank you for joining us and being here with us. Um, and <laughs> okay. yeah, he doesn't understand that this is the speaker panel, so he just jumped in without realizing that he's visible on the camera right now. Ah, okay. <laughs> so welcome and thank you. Oh, but really beautiful presentation. Thank you so much, Neha. Thank really, you so much, really. Okay, so now we're going to the next speaker. And uh, the next speaker is um, Daniel Abdul Rahman. Um, and Daniel is currently the director of the CEO's office at the Sunway Education Group, one of Malaysia's uh, largest nonprofit education social enterprises. Um, the group is a huge proponent of the UN Sustainable Development Goals and is the host of the Jeffrey Sachs Center on Sustainable Development, the SDG Academy under the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, as well as the the Sunway Center for Planetary Health, both of which are located within their Sunway University. Having started his career as a human rights and constitutional law lawyer, Daniel's professional journey has traversed uh, policy, education, media, and technology. Daniel writes a regular column for the Star newspaper, Malaysia's top English daily on various topics, including education, environment, technology, and society. He's also part-time host um, a, on a a TV talk show for Bernama, Malaysia's national news agency. Aside from writing and moderating, Daniel has been invited to speak on artificial intelligence, the future of work, and UN Sustainable Development Goals by banks, government agencies, and international, internationally renowned uh, institutions. From time to time, he also trains civil servants and students on public policy and strategic communications. Daniel holds a postgraduate law degree from the University of Oxford. So welcome, Daniel. Um, this will be really interesting. Thank you. All right, can you hear me, uh, Lucia? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I sort of gave a longer one thinking you might, you know, cut it a little bit, uh, but thank you for watching us through that. Um, and um, good morning, good, good, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Um, well, not, don't go yet. Uh, for everyone who's with us today, thank you so much for joining us and um, for the opportunity to address, uh, to share a little bit with all of you here. Um, just gonna take note of the time, all right? Uh, and, you know, it was really interesting to, to listen to uh, Neha's presentation and sharing earlier. Uh, I think as, as we get older and, you know, at least for me, the body starts to creak a little bit, uh, then you start wondering what, what's wrong and then how does one sort of heal, right? And I thought that was uh, absolutely insightful that it's not just the, the medication, it's a myriad of factors. Uh, and I hope we can have a, a bit more of a chat about that later. Um, my sharing will be um, on the SDGs, Driving Innovation and the Future of Work. Um, I'll be talking about it in the context of Sunway Education Group. Uh, it's a, it's a, we are a, quite a big group. We are part of uh, the Sunway Group in Malaysia. Um, the Sunway Education Group has about 20 over entities within it. We've got a university, uh, five colleges, two international schools, um, and many centers, which I'll be sharing about uh, later. So the reason why I've titled this this presentation as such is because we, when we educate our students and, and as we, and how we approach 
um, our, our education is also with, by, by looking at the future. And we are very much big proponents of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we believe that by looking at the SDGs uh, and innovation and the future job market, that's what we will know uh, where our focuses should lie as we deliver this education for our students. Yeah, so um, it's just gonna be in four quick parts um, and, and then we'll have a bit of Q&A later on. Um, so, so first part is the fourth industrial revolution, uh, our machines and automation taking over. And I wanted to share this bit to set a bit of context on the challenges or the trends that we are facing. Um, I believe many of us have heard of the fourth industrial revolution, we are living in it. Some are now already talking about the fifth industrial revolution, um, but here you have it once again. And by and large, it is driven by advancements that we can see in uh, AI, machine learning, Internet of Things, autonomous hardware, and advanced data systems. And now a few reports over there have come out, which um, some of us might be familiar with. So, you know, back in 2016, the Future of Jobs report by the World Economic Forum said that 5.1 million jobs will disappear to the disruption. In the 2018 report, you know, the numbers were updated because of trends, things emerging around us, and it said 75 million jobs will be lost, but 133 million uh, new roles will emerge as technology advances. Now, in the 2020 report, um, it's sort of been adjusted a little bit more, and you know, it doesn't talk about just disappearing jobs, but the changing of roles. And it says that 97 new roles slash jobs will emerge, whereas 85 million will be need to be reconfigured. It's not, it's not lost here. It's you know, reconfigured or the, the, the nature of those roles will change. And the important question that we ask ourselves, and I, I believe it's not just relevant to us in Sunway, but also those of you wherever you are, is who will be filling up these jobs? Because there will be a net, um, sorry, there will be actually a surplus of jobs than actually those that disappear. And the question becomes, how do we prepare our young people for it? <coughs> Excuse me. Of course, the report also looked at the impact of COVID-19 and how it is pushing companies to scale remote work, to accelerate, accelerate digitization, as well as automation. So we are living in a time of all these things happening around us. Just wanted to bring a little bit of context to ASEAN. Um, to understand what's currently happening here. This number shows the sort of broad overview of the labor force in member states um, of ASEAN and Southeast Asia. And on the right, you have some data points um, from various think tanks, research institutions, management consultants about um, the nature of the job market. I, I won't go into details. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's here for, uh, for you to kind of look at. The long and short of it is um, there will be a change in the time to come. And that time is effectively now. So moving on quickly to the second part is, what are the employment trends happening globally as well as in Malaysia? Many of us would have read about the great resignation um, as you know, COVID lockdowns in the world, uh, around the world uh, end. Uh, we see that 11.5 million workers have quit their jobs in the spring of 2021. Uh, why? For various reasons, right? Uh, the prioritization of life is different. What has become more important after being locked down for so long? I think, you know, Neha was talking about better mindfulness of oneself. So a lot of this has emerged and we see people are leaving en masse, right? But interestingly enough, um, just a couple of weeks ago, the new trend seems to be the great resignation may be followed by the great regret. So, you know, as, 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 COVID has, has taught us one thing and, and we've all moved in one particular direction. Now that things are sort of coming back to some normalcy, it's moving in the opposite direction. Uh, now this could mean a few things. It could mean that people felt that the grass was green on the other side, but it's not. But it could also mean that perhaps we've not really learned our post-COVID lessons properly and that we are just defaulting to ways of the old. Um, I don't know what it might, which one it is. Perhaps you could drop a comment in the Q&A above. The next global trend is the gender gap, and it continues to persist. Um, in the recent uh, WEF report, it says that it'll take about 267.6 years to close workplace disparities um, globally. And you know that's clearly a very alarming number. Um, according to the OECD, uh, social institutions and gender index, women around the world carry up to 10 times more work than men especially during the lockdown, this was the lockdown, this was prevalent. 
And you know, in Malaysia, there was an uptick uh, in domestic violence cases reported during the pandemic. So we see that the, 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 the challenges surrounding gender are still very much there. Some of it exacerbated during COVID. And of course, depending on where you are in the world, um, there are different priorities and different uh, hills to climb. The next one is the shifts in non-standard work. Um, in Malaysia, out of our 15 plus million uh, strong labor force, about 4 million are in the, work, in the gig economy one way or the other. And in the World Bank um, 2020 report, it highlighted that 26 percent were gig workers. So different numbers depending on you know, who you ask or where you look at. Um, in Malaysia, uh, Grab Food and Food Panda are two big e-hailing uh, services. And we see that a lot of people are moving in that direction. This in itself also creates um, um, conversations about reliance on foreign labor, um, low wages, or even just opportunities to move up that scale. So remember the earlier slide about the emerging jobs and how many of those are in data for IR spaces. Now, how do we fill those demands? Uh, and then this has sort of like a wider implication for you know, national economy. Okay. Um, of course, the other trend is continuous upskilling and lifelong learning. Um, I know in, the, in, in, in London, for example, some universities are opening cohorts specifically for people who are retirees and they treat the 60 and above cohort as, you know, just like any other student, they go to class with everyone, but they have very specific programs planned for them. Um, in Asia Pacific, there are 28 million learners um, um, and, you know, online learning has provided access unlike ever before. Uh, what I would love highlighting, what I love highlighting is the, the pictures you see below. And in Malaysia, we've got something called APEL, sounds a bit like Apple, but it stands for the Accreditation of Prior Experiential Learning. And what it is, is it allows people who don't have formal education qualifications, but they have worked you know, as entrepreneurs, or they've, had, they've held a, nine, a, a standard job for a certain period of time, to come into education using work as qualifications. So the picture you see on the left is a good friend of mine. He's a friend of mine now, uh, Mr. Ezaz. He was a school dropout at 14. He started a music business at 18. And at the age of 32, he went straight uh, to an MBA. So he, you know, no O-levels, no A-levels, no degree, but straight to an MBA. And that's very possible. On the right is uh, Michael Verapun. He's a famous Malaysian jazz pianist. Uh, he does not have a degree, but he went straight for a master's um, because on the back of his kind of musical experience and industry experience. And I think these are unique trends that are happening around the world. And of course, the other one is enhancing the number of women uh, playing a role in TVET. TVET here stands for Technical Vocational Education and Training. Um, it goes by different nomenclatures depending on where you are in the world. But it is also then very important to see diversification of the workforce by encouraging more women to get involved in this space, which is traditionally seen as you know, more male dominated uh, as it is. And now we move on to part three, the future of jobs and the UN SDGs driving innovation. So you know, earlier we saw kind of like the changes in the job market, then we saw global trends and how it impacts. And now kind of like, let's tie this together uh, with the SDGs as well as the jobs market. Fundamentally, what we're experiencing isn't new per se. Uh, it is history repeating itself. Uh, on the, in these pictures, you can see amusingly on the left, a, a window knocker uh, before the days of alarm and irritating uh, mobile phone tunes that go off in the morning, you actually had a person who'd go around, knock on your window to wake you up. Uh, in the middle, bowling pin stutter. Now, you know, it's all automated. And on the right, you see a factory lecture. So, you know, pre-radio uh, days. Um, and this is what these technologies are today. In fact, it's, it's more than that, right? Once upon a time, uh, this gentleman here, it was, you know, kind of like super cool. You know, he's got all the gadgets, the gizmos, and all of this can be found in your smartphone. Um, so, you know, this kind of also just shows how technology has just sort of come together. And you would imagine everyone who used to work on assembly lines, um, putting together these um, electronics, machines, and technologies are now focused on this, right? But as we say, you know, one job gone, other just created. Um, I am a fan of this uh, very famous photo of, of, um, uh, of, of, the, of workers back in the day, and now you put the robots there. Of course, we can see that there, there aren't women in this photo. So you can even see, in, even in this context, gender challenges still remain big challenges. Um, 
And I'd like just to ask all of you who are tuning in with us, um, how many of you have heard of any of these jobs from number one to number nine? This is from LinkedIn, uh, which talks about emerging jobs uh, around the world. There's iOS developer, Android, Zumba instructor, anyone? Uh, social media intern, data scientist, UI UX designer, big data architect, beach body coach, and cloud services specialist. Now, um, so I actually can't see uh, comments coming through at the moment, but if I were to ask you, how many of you have heard of any of these jobs or not heard of any of these jobs? Perhaps you can sort of do a virtual hand raise or sort of in your own mind. But what if I told you this list is already eight years old, right? So it's not something that was from a year or two ago, which also shows that, you know, even as long as, as, as eight, six, seven, eight years ago, there were already all these emerging things. And now I think this list would have influencer. Let's not even go into metaverse or, or you know, Tesla bots and Androids, uh, but that's another big space. Now, in a, in a report by the Center for the Future of Work, which talks about um, jobs of the future, uh, just some highlights that, that seem to have popped out would be, for example, uh, AI-assisted healthcare technician, a fitness commitment counselor, or you know, what Neha's doing, right? Uh, wellness. Uh, you've got artificial intelligence, business development manager, or even a genomic portfolio director. There was a point in time where at the height of COVID, people said vaccine advisor uh, would come into play as if somebody would advise you which vaccines to choose because that has implications on your health, uh, where you can travel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so what it also goes to show is that this, this is an area that's, that's, that's constantly emerging. Um, I believe a couple of years ago, the US Labor Department also released a statistic which said children today or something like 70, um, we'll be growing, we will be educating children today for 75% of jobs that don't yet exist. Uh, and we wouldn't even know what those jobs are. Of course, one of my favorites uh, would be the digital detox specialist, where we kind of get away from our always connected, always on uh, world. And I don't know, I mean, I, th I think what Neha spoke about earlier was something that, that could be done. Uh, so more than just jobs, right? We also then have the SDGs to empower our children uh, and to solve Earth's greatest challenges. And I'm just going to play a quick video. I hope the volume, uh, and of course, you know, we, we all know this, the SDG um, map, the 17 SDGs. And there's a short video. Um, there's some music, but if the music doesn't play, don't worry, because there's there are pop-up and there are prompts. So I'm just going to play this video. It's about a minute and a half long. Enjoy. Sorry. All right. Um, so I hope that, that the one and a half minutes sort of gave you an overview. Um, yes, it's very much artificial intelligence focused, but it also shows you the different aspects of technology, um, SDGs, and how all of those come together and kind of like the areas in which we could inspire our young people to, to kind of do something. Um, let me move on. Uh, I initially, so I think just kind of being inspired by Neha's speech earlier, I also kind of 
had this slide, but I was, I was planning not showing or not showing, but I'm just going to pop it here. If you look at the, the, just the human being and, and, and kind of like where technology and education can come into play, there's so many areas. So for example, when you talk about AI for early warning medical conditions, um, you can look at the brain uh, uh, and, and, and illnesses or diseases like depression and Alzheimer's, the kidney, the heart, uh, the gut, uh, the womb. Then you've got smart medical devices, bones, smart drills, uh, lungs, asthma monitoring, AI-powered insulin pumps, uh, closed-loop pancreas, and in AI for medical imaging, there's renal cell carcinoma using digital microscope slides, um, detect eye diseases, um, breast cancer, um, even skin, uh, infl inflammatory bowel syndrome using abdominal MRIs. So, I mean, the, 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 and you can see that there's such a, a huge and wide application and there's so many areas in which technology and SDGs um, can come together and drive change for the betterment of society. Um, and I'll just move before going on to the last part. I think it's all I have to mention uh, climate change or as some say the climate crisis. Um, this was an earlier report, report five, I'm not mistaken, uh, where the UN Secretary General Antonio uh, Guterres said that it's a code rate for humanity. I think the more the, the, the latest report um, sounds the alarm bells even more alarmingly so. And we can see just you know by Googling up, by looking at the news. Um, we have unprecedented floods, fires. Uh, Malaysia is not, has not been spared either. Uh, interestingly, during COVID, we remember there was a lot of environmental rehabilitation. When we were locked down, it was an opportunity for human, mother nature, humankind um, to sort of heal itself. Yet that's, that seems to be reversing now that everyone's out and about again. So this moves me on to the last part of my sharing bit which is what the Sunway Education Group is doing. And our journey essentially started in 1974. Uh, we say that we are a wasteland to a wonderland. The Sunway area started off as um, uh, an old mining, tin mining extraction quarry, which was then abandoned because it had um, sort of depleted its resources. And it was then taken over by our chairman and founder, Tan Sri Jeffrey Chia, and then turned into what you see on the right hand side. So this has been almost 50 years uh, in the making. It's a beautiful place. I am, where am I in this photo? Oh, actually, no, this picture is probably taken from the building I'm currently in. Yeah, that's right, the university. And we we do release sustainability reports. We've got one online, which is accessible for everybody. And you could, um, you could Google Sunway Sustainability Report. I uh, didn't have time to put up a QR code. And this is our second report which is on building an equitable and climate resilient society. Um, I just want to share a little bit, kind of like very high level points. We've got five goals and we have announced that we want to achieve net zero carbon by 2050. Uh, we've also started looking at um, carbon, uh, sorry, halving, halving by 2030, um, as well as other goals. We've got 19 targets across five goals, as you can see here. And yeah, this, this is the one. Uh, having emissions by 2030 by looking at internal carbon pricing. We want to engage with stakeholders to reduce our scope three emissions and getting to net zero by 2050. Um, this is sort of just a sampling of the broad areas that we are looking at in our five goals. So everything, for example, if you look at, um, let's, let's look at number three, developing a safe and equal and dignified workforce. When you look at it from a capital perspective, it's social capital, human capital. The material issues are human rights, labor practices, freedom of association, et cetera, et cetera. Activities are you know, having to recognize best practices, uh, enhance security, learning and development opportunities, and then talk about the value we create. So we've mapped everything that this, the group is doing across these five goals and trying to align to make sure that you know, we create the best environment, not just for ourselves, but for everyone around us, as well as you know, in all the countries that we are in. Um, just an example, a sampling of the kind of information that we track. What you see on the left is total energy consumption. But what I find quite uh, interesting is the decorative items that we use during the festive seasons. As you know, Malaysia is a very multiracial country and we celebrate Chinese New Year, the Mid-Autumn Festival, uh, Deepavali, um, Eid, as well as Halloween. And 
This is, I believe, um, the tracking that's done by our malls. So we have one of the biggest malls in Malaysia, and this also shows the kind of items. And we try to make sure that by tracking this, we are able to reuse and we don't unnecessarily waste um, the, the, the stuff that we buy, right? So it becomes more sustainable. Uh, an example from the education side, uh, we've installed solar panels in various buildings. And as you can see, the building energy intensity has gone down um, from by 33% from 2015. This was just before uh, the COVID cutoff, of course, so that you know it doesn't like drop because of COVID. Uh, on the right, you can see samples of where we've installed the solar panels, and it's 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 all of them. It's an ongoing effort. Um, broadly, and I won't I won't go into too many details here, but we've also tracked our performance on sustainability across the 17 SDGs. All of this is available in the report, and you know feel free to 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 have a look at it. Um, some sustainability awards and recognition. Um, I won't go into details here. And fundamentally, this is kind of like what we want to create, right? Um, a smart city, which is sustainable um, for everyone around us. Uh, so a few things at the education group, as Lucia had also mentioned earlier, as proponents of the SDGs, we are host to the Jeffrey Sachs Center on Sustainable Development here at Sunway Education Group. Uh, we are also very proud host of the SDG Academy. Um, my good friend uh, Shannon uh, and uh, the Kuala Lumpur office here. And we are trying to scale um, SDG education in schools. We also recently launched something called the Sunway Plant Cent uh, Center for Planetary Health, recognizing that planetary health also plays a role in the relationship, not just among humans, but between humans, the environment, flora and fauna uh, for, the, for, the, for um, the future. And we've even got a planetary health pledge which we get our students to, to pledge so that you know they are they become more environmentally conscious. Um, on the technology front, we've launched 42 KL, which is a coding school. Um, it is zero tuition fees, zero teachers, zero classes, 100% coding, where students learn from each other about um, coding and the processes. This is an alternative pathway where anyone between the ages of anyone 18 and above can participate and it is industry-led um, to, to solve industry challenges. And this is very unique. It's been around for about one and a half years, um, keeping in mind the, the challenges during COVID. And so far, it's just been progressing very positively. Yep, we've also got the Future Recitis Research Institute looking at urbanization, which is gonna be a massive challenge in times to come. Um, very recently, we are also part of the Mission 4.7, uh, Education for Sustainable Development Efforts where we want to try to inculcate ESD within uh, Malaysian schools as well as around the region. Of course, the SDG Academy is working very hard and uh, on this, and you know, we're very, very proud to support this effort. Um, of course, uh, food security is a, a very important point uh, for all of us, and the Sunway Future X farm has been created in order to not just you know, produce food, but also for sustainability education. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice farm. We've got a good restaurant here. If anybody happens to come around to Bandar Sunway in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, please drop me a line and I'll be happy to bring you over uh, for lunch. If it's not too big a group, I'll buy you lunch. Right? If it's too big, then uh, we'll, we'll have a discussion about that. Um, these are the kinds of, of, of um, produce that is, is produced at the farm. There are actually, there are actually more. Uh, I was initially going to hide the, well, I was going to do this, so clearly my, graphics have not come out in the right order. And then with, I was going to ask you whether you could name the different vegetables, but let's not do that right now. Um, but here's what we have as the offerings. Um, interestingly, and then looking at it from an employment entrepreneurship opportunity, we also, uh, there's a subscription service where you could be a, a groaner. Well, not a groaner as in groaning, but a green owner, growth owner. Whereas for a certain price, uh, fixed price, kind of like a Netflix subscription, but imagine Netflix for vegetables, if you like vegetables. So that's kind of like the model here. And in conclusion, um, I'd like to highlight something that um, Professor Jeff Sachs has said about the education aspect. You know, he says students hear about it, the sustainable development goals. They want to know more about it, but they don't get it, as in they don't get access to it. 
they don't get the scientific dimension, the political dimension, or the business dimension. Yet in a few years, in their jobs, they will have to deal with sustainability, ESG, and all sorts of SDG-related issues in their businesses. This is why SDG education is important. And this is one of the reasons why um, the education group is very much supportive of SDGs. We believe that education on sustainability equips students with knowledge and skills in emerging markets, um, from new methods of recycling to consultancy roles. So it's a myriad of, of things, right? And it provides job opportunities which could help overcome poverty. So keeping the eye on the prize, that's really what it's about. And I'll end with a quote uh, by our founder and chairman, Tansri Jeffrey Chia, where he says that our efforts at Sunway are driven by our recognition that realizing the SDGs is not the sole responsibility of the government. It requires the commitment of all private, of all the commitment of all sectors of society, the private sector, academia, civil society, and of course, every single individual. We are all in this together. Last slide, I believe. And we have to focus on what's essential, uh, the hand, the head, and above all, the heart. And I think the heart is, is, is very much important in this journey of employment, education, technology, SDGs. Uh, and if our heart's in the right place, uh, you know, God willing, um, we will be able to make a change. On that note, thank you very much. I shall end here and, and hand the floor over to Lucia. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes, both, <laughs> you know, both uh, presentations have been very, very inspiring um, and wonderful. Um, and so we are now um, open to taking questions. I think this is set up like webinar style, unfortunately, which doesn't allow me um, the opportunity to open up and have people ask their questions directly. So you have to put that put it in the Q&A. But one question I have is um, really based on this for both of you. Um, Danielle, you said that the children of today are being raised for 75% of jobs that don't exist, right? Yeah. So how can we best prepare for these opportunities? Like for both, you know, in terms of the jobs that are to come and Neha for, you know, how can somebody, how can you change that mindset of you got to go to school, you have to, you know, do your different levels of degrees and there will be a job out there waiting for you. It seems to me that both of you, or especially Neha, you have gone out and created this opportunity. You had this long-term vision and you just did it. But what, how, I mean, what what do our youth of today or, or even mid-career professionals who are in the process of maybe wanting to change what they're doing, how, what, what advice would you give them? Um, who should be who should start? Yeah, anyone, either one of you. Daniel, it's a nice, you know, say, yeah, you can start and then I'll follow. Thank you. Sure. Uh, you know, coincidentally, I had a slide for that, uh, which I didn't show earlier, but I'll just kind of very quickly show. I think keeping in mind all the challenges that we see, I think it boils down to this essential, these two things, right? Mindset skills and participation skills. Um, Mindset skills are about honing analytical, critical thinking, creativity, curiosity, and initiative, initiative taking, problem solving, cognitive, um, and it's, it's all there. And of course, committed and capable of lifelong learning. I think remembering that learning doesn't end once you're out of school or university. Then there's participation skills, um, you know, being emotionally and culturally intelligent, environmentally concerned, trustworthy. So I think the short answer uh, the, or the, the long answer then to Lucia's question is educators or people in a position need to be keep to, to, to hone these mindsets and these approaches in the young people um, because you might teach something that's technical and that might be overtaken by automation. But these skills are, I believe, uh, evergreen and everlasting. Uh, and that curiosity, I believe, is, is what will continue us, continue to allow us to be agile and adaptable for the 70% 75% of the unknown uh, for what's to come. Right. Yeah, I think what Daniel said made excellent sense that technical skills will be overcome, will be overtaken by technology or something else, or they will be obsolete. Um, uh, one, one very strong example, which I like to quote every time is that writing is an essential skill. Every single child in school is taught writing first. 
And what we don't know is that writing is something which is going to turn into an art form very soon, because we would not need writing in the next 20 years, because everything would be voice activated, everything would be AI based. So this, this form will turn into something which is which artists do. If you know writing, that's good. So the idea that right now, what the way we teach children specifically and up to graduates is that we teach them subjects. Every information which is given to them is very subject-based. You know, Learn math, learn science, learn biotechnology, learn biochemistry or whatever. What we don't learn is that these are things which can be picked up at any point in life. The skills which actually need to be taught and learned are leadership, you know, life, basically everything which is life based, how to conduct yourself in life, how, how, what is, uh, if you want to launch a business, how should you do that? And I'm not talking about the MBA courses, I'm just talking about that mindset of um, entrepreneurship. So the skills which were being taught post industrialization are already 150 to 100 years old. And now a huge shift in mindset is required as to what should we teach children as a core curriculum versus what technical skills should be provided on top of it. And when you're talking about professionals or early professionals, young professionals, this is something which you everybody needs to understand. Skills are transferable. So if you were trained as a chemist, it does not mean that you will you know, you have to be a chemist for your own, a whole life, or you will be working in the field of chemistry. What you understand is measurements. What you understand is how two different components come together to make a third one, how two different things react and can either make something gorgeous or can either lead to devastation. That is the skill which can be transferred to, to almost any other facet or any other field you are interested in. Keep your eyes and ears open and instead of putting on blinders, which say that this is the path which I have chosen and forever I will be moving into this. You know, open up to things which genuinely excite and interest you. Open up to things, your ideas, which you really believe in. And then see how your training or your skill can actually be extrapolated and can actually be helpful in the thing which you want to start now. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my. Um one question that keeps come up, coming up for me, and you know, and maybe it's not as relevant for the audience that's here with us today, but how? But I'm going to ask it anyway. So, how do we make this this new lifestyle, this new thinking, accessible to people that one maybe you know can't eat healthy every day, for example? Um, can't afford the, I mean, I'm in the USA and I know that to go to eat organic every day, for example, it will just, it's, it's going to eat up my salary, period. Uh, and won't really allow me to even pay for my rent because the prices of those foods in the city, especially, are so high. Um, or you know, may not have the possibilities of going to, even if you don't have, you know, even if you don't follow the traditional pathway to college and school, you know, even if you, the alternatives that are available for those people, for example, that can't afford to go to school, for example, what can they, you know, what, what are the opportunities? Are they being left out? Will they be left out from this new world, these new opportunities that you're presenting to us today? I don't know. This is just something that I had in my mind, so I'm just putting it out there. Are we see, living? First... Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm yeah. sorry, Naha. No. Uh, see, the, the only thing which will work is constant education and educating at all levels, not just at a particular you know, at a particular strata or to a particular, you know, set of people. But then this education will have to seep through, like it will have to be a vertical education. And again, nothing but a policy level change or nothing but a large level uh, change in mindset can bring this to happen. Now, when we are talking, so because you gave a very specific example of of food, that, that that is the food which is available. You can't afford, not everybody can make a pilgrimage to a farmer's market and maybe the organic, you know, GMO free food is very expensive where you live. Uh, and as I was saying, this is, this is the irony of uh, affluent diseases or lifestyle based diseases <laughs> now, which is, 
the thing which we have come to realize and understand is that we need to follow a 70-30 um, you know, ratio. Not everything is under your control. You can't see where your food. So if you get a bag of spinach from the supermarket, you can't see where it's coming from. But then how you consume it, what you pair it with, what you do with your lifestyle in your everyday is something which you can actually control. So that is the kind of education and training which needs to be, again, see, doing a 100% perfect life, I'm not even sure if that is possible or practical for anybody who is living in the 21st century. That's that's dystopia, at least in this life. You can maybe retire to the mountains and live a life in a silo and then it might be possible. So our aim should be to do a 70-30 thing. And as constantly, I was trying to tell you that understand your body physiology, understand what your body desires and wants and things which can be changed should definitely be changed. And now, and things which cannot be managed should, should just for now, you know, you can just let them be and, and see what happens. This is still a huge change from the status quo. Uh, Daniel, would you like to continue with the education side of example? Sure. Um, is, is, can you hear me now? Go ahead. Um, is the volume okay? All right. Uh, it's a very interesting question, Yukia, and, and um, interesting points. Uh, yeah, and I agree with you. In context-wise, you know, it's hard for me to talk on, on behalf of Malaysia. We've got the highest obesity rates uh, in Southeast Asia. I think we might be even maybe highest in Asia. So that's a big problem. Oh, someone is saying voice is uh, very low. Very low, yes. Okay. How's it sound now? For me, it's yes. fine, but everybody else? Yeah, how's everyone else? Oh, okay. all good. Okay, thank you. Yeah, somebody texted me saying that they couldn't quite hear my presentation. Yes, so, I saw yeah. that. Oh, someone said oh, it's low. Slow. Let me uh, Sorry, let uh, me better try. than before. Okay. Okay, how about now? Yes, for me, it's fine. What about everybody else? Yeah. Okay, I, I, technology. Um, so Malaysia has an issue with obesity. Um, you know, in our federal capital, a UNICEF report uh, back in 2018 said that we had stunting problems and this mm. wasn't in rural Malaysia this was in federal capital and you know and, and sort of looking at these two things you see that the problems are multiple it's it's culture uh, Malaysia we pride ourselves on having great food uh, I'm sure Shannon would have told you that um, but at the same time um, it's also how do we encourage healthier eating less sugar uh, and, and all of that, right? So a few things will happen. Number one, it's government plays a role, especially when it comes to habits amongst children in schools. And Malaysia, for example, even for uh, children from poorer parts of Malaysia, we have the, we call it the RMT, the uh, food, it's, it's like a food plan. So Monday to Fridays, government provides some milk, some food. Um, at the individual level, it gets a bit trickier, right? Because as adults, we all sort of have our own autonomy on how we, how we run out, how we sort of conduct our lives. And oftentimes life changes happen in a few ways. Number one, um, you face a health crisis, right? Somebody falls sick and then you go, my life needs to change. And then suddenly that creates that realization. Uh, or number two, it could just be, um, you know, I, I suppose my personal experience was I was quite a, a chubby kid growing up and mm -hmm. there were elements where people used to make fun of me and you'd get bullied and I'm like, yeah, this has to stop. And the only way to stop that is for me to lose weight, start exercising. And then I picked up that habit. Uh, but I think, uh, Lucia, perhaps uh, uh, just another angle to answer that is it has to be community-based. I feel when we talk about the individual changing their lifestyles as an individual, that sort of misses out on the point that the community needs to play a role. So for example, the X farms that we have here in Sunway is not meant to serve the entire country. It's meant to serve the community in which Sunway is based, right? So, and it's, I mean, it's not currently cheap, but we also work with a number of NGOs here that collect food and then process it for the wider community. Um, Malaysians are a very generous bunch. There was a point where people were giving out uh, food to the poor in the capital of Kuala Lumpur, and they were actually choosing what they wanted to eat. And they even some of them even said, we get too much rice every day. So, you know, it's, it's quite a tangential challenge that we have here. But I do feel that if communities start being more conscious of who is there within the community, that's the quickest way to um, solve it. So it's not just a very high level governmental um, challenge that we see. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. I mean, for both, this has been so interesting, very, very interesting. It's really made me personally question <laughs> how I'm living my life and, and given me some ideas of some of the things that I need to do. Can both of you, if, you, if you're um, able, please drop your maybe contact info if you want to share it or even your website so that those who are, are online, they can connect with you. And also remember that this is recorded. So once this is finished, I'm going to be sending this out, um, you know, and other people who are in, unable to be here today with us will be able to see this because this has been really, really interesting and very, very helpful. Um, any last closing words that you, there was one question, but I, I, I didn't really ask it because I think you've, You've already addressed it, but I'll ask it out loud so that, you know, whoever asked it, the anonymous attendee feels acknowledged. And it was, how do you design effective training for local people? So that was the question that was asked. Um, but if you want to add something to that question, that's fine. I think you've, you've really have addressed it in, in, in one way or the other. But if you want to add anything to it, that's fine. But just make sure your contact is available, please. Or, and if you don't have anything to say about that question, any closing uh, words, any last closing words you want to add? Thank you. Neha? Uh, yeah, just one quick thing, because I think this came, this question came immediately after my presentation. So uh, for local people, right now, we it's a very specific challenge because we are living in the mountains and surrounded by primarily rural population. And the thing is that there the challenge is completely opposite to what Lucia was saying. There is no dearth of you know, quality food or um, it's an agri-based economy. The challenge here is that people are busy. They don't, again, like everybody, nobody has time to take out you know, specific uh, pockets of time for focusing on their health. These people are constantly moving. People around us are constantly doing physical labor. The challenge there becomes is that their knees and their joints are short completely because it's an uphill terrain. They're working, they're standing constantly. So on one hand, where there is a population which is sitting constantly for 12 hours, there is also another side where people are constantly standing on their feet for 12 hours. There they need to be trained. Women, for example, women health, women's health is something which is completely ignored in, in most part of, of, like if I may take the liberty of saying most country, uh, most part of the countries. So that is something where we need to really focus. And that is what we do. So we try and arrange local workshops and local seminars where people can walk in or we go to these specific areas in the villages and mobilize community volunteers, basically. Not something which we... So there's one thing which we have understood that there are there is, you know, him healthcare is a small team. We can't be present everywhere. So you need to create an army. And how do you create an army? By training these people. See, once a person understands the benefits of something, you don't have to push them to take it forward. Then they will organically take the lead and do it. So we go out to these village areas, uh, train volunteers there, and then it becomes their responsibility to bring women together or to bring their community people together and to hold these small camps or workshops where they encourage them. Um, so this is the model which we are following currently, and we hope to scale up at some point right now, maybe not as the, it's not the right time, but then at least at the local level, this is something uh, which is working for us. So creating local level volunteers, and then training them to take it further where our hands and feet cannot reach. Uh, so yeah, that was uh, my uh, answer to the last question. And as a closing remark, I would just like to say that it was fantastic. This whole session was fabulous. Um, uh, my experience with ICSD has not just been of this one, but we have worked together in the past as well. And just listening to new ideas every single time is, so here's the thing, there are things which you read. Daniel did not say something which was, you know, out of the world extraordinary. I did not say something which nobody had heard before, right? The ideas have already existed. It's just that because in this rat race and the race which we are running, <laughs> We, we keep forgetting these things which are very, very important. And being a part of these sessions just sort of, it, it acts as an excellent reminder to bring those things home. So, you know, those, those things just come back to you and you realize that these are the things which you should not let go of. 
life will never stop moving your work will never stop moving your your relationships will go go right and then they will be nice and everything will just keep going the way it is just do not lose track of the priorities do not lose track of this one physical body and mental body which you have been given because this is something which will take you which will be with you till till your last breath so everything else might just fail everything else again as they say that you know when your last moment comes nobody remembers that one great presentation which you gave or that you know one project report which you presented what matters is how healthy you are feeling how not miserable you are when you are 95 years old or 98 years old so yeah just take care of yourself take care of your body and remember that you are really important to yourself and that's how i would just like to close thank you so much thank you daniel yeah uh i echo everything that uh, neha said thank you so much uh, lucia and team and everyone who joined us today uh, from around the world um i think just one mine has been very much on education uh, i've shared a quote in the chat box which i think really encapsulates um our way of living right uh, where it says you know uh, the literate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write but those who cannot learn unlearn and relearn uh, it's uh, it's a quote by elvin toffler um it's quite well known and i think if we if we live by this um the at least that that curiosity uh and the wonderment of the world that we have around us we can make the world a better place um so whenever things seem tough i think always remember that there are like minded people around uh who are in it um to to just make the world better So thank you so much uh, again, and and it's such a pleasure to be on uh, on this panel and uh, this session with Neha. I learned a lot too. Thank no, you. this has been the best panel. I really, really have <laughs> enjoyed it. Really, really have enjoyed it. It's been an inspiration. Uh, Neha, next time we speak, um, you will see a difference in my lifestyle, <laughs> my mental health. um because i i absolutely need it so this is really um it's been fantastic and just i know that daniel already writes a column because this, it was part of his bio but neha i'm not sure if you're writing any columns or putting yourself out there in that way a, a blog um because you know these are seeds of wisdom and i think you know we have to disseminate it wider more broadly yes so it's on our website uh we keep writing health blogs on our website which is himhealth.com um and there is an instagram page unfortunately we are not on twitter right now i'm personally on linkedin but yes himhealth.com website has all the write ups and the same uh, uh, handle can be checked out on instagram as well well to both of you again thank you have a blessed day really appreciate it you've blessed me with really everything that you've said i really i this has been fantastic thank you thank you so much lucia thank you so much daniel thanks thank you bye everyone bye take care everyone